Hey, how's it going? My name is John Harwood, and I'm the author of Leech Mob. I'll be reading chapters one and two for you now. I hope you enjoy it. Chapter one. Welcome to Riverview High. September 1990. Fair Hill Psychiatric Hospital was an ancient nut house with a maze of concrete tunnels running underneath the joint to keep the patients from seeing the light of day. All I remember was going to that crazy rave and getting tear gassed by the cops who then pulled us out choking to death. Or maybe it was just me who they dragged out. Anyway, I must have taken something. I just don't remember what it was. And the next thing I knew, the cops hauled me into crisis intervention where the doctors held clipboards and stared at me through plexiglass windows. One doctor looked real evil, like he was planning on lobotomizing me the first chance he got. And then I was being transferred to state hospital where I was escorted by the frowns and white. Now we were walking up this caged in staircase with adolescent ward building F stenciled in blood on the cracked and water stained walls. Why F? I asked a tall orderly with a Jamaican accent and a sideways name tag which read Bunny. You don't like apps, man? Nah, I got too many of those in school, I mumbled, and Bunny cracked up. Ain't nothing to worry about. Those letters don't mean anything, man. Each division has its own share of complicated issues. Bunny spoke in a sing-song voice before lowering his tone. Especially here. He hit the buzzer on the outdated security system. Ward F, came the static reply. Open a bomb clot, man. The intercom screamed, and the door swung open. Stay calm was stenciled high on the moldy, pale green walls with rusted metal grates covering every window. The building looked gothic, with hissing radiators and buzzing fluorescence, which lit the place up in a sickly yellow hue. Two dim hallways stretched in opposite directions, male only and female only, and in the middle, glassed off, was a bullpen with Nurses Station F covered in signs, staff only, no medication dispensed outside of medication modules, lost dog, missing since 4190, last seen F Ward, if anyone has any information regarding Bowser, please see Edguina, all information will remain confidential. Here's a new patient, Dr. G. From his paper stacked desk, the doctor, with tufts of white hair floating above each ear, gazed over his thin reading glasses. He was a black man in his mid-fifties. Oh yes, I've been expecting this young man. I'll be at me desk. Bunny nodded and stepped out, leaving the door slightly ajar. I've already reviewed your file. My name is Dr. Gildmore. Go on and take a seat. So this is what, the third time you've been arrested? Something like that. Well, why don't you tell me about this group you've been hanging out with? The Leech Mob. Your mother brought in this newspaper article. I leaned forward, shaking my head, which was still swimming in chemicals that made my eyes run. Leech Mob Leech arrested mob after, fight, mob at after fight at school. I read and looked up sheepishly. What's there to say? I don't want to get them in trouble or anything, and besides, I don't rat. The doctor chuckled. I wonder about you kids sometimes. So what's the day in the life of the leech mob like? What do you guys do? Visit the elderly or that sort of thing? Yeah, sometimes. But usually they just call the cops. Gildmore lowered his voice. You've also lost some friends, I see. You want to talk about them? Which ones? I folded my arms. Have their deaths put a lot of stress on you? Were they a part of this leech mob too? I think I missed their funerals. Now that got me depressed, and when I get depressed, I don't feel like doing anything, especially talking. And that's all adults want to hear me do, to confess what I've done. I plead the fifth. I know my damn rights. That's right. You do have patient rights. And if you're like most of the others, you aren't too happy being stuck in here. But few understand that I'm their ticket out of here. What's that supposed to mean? It means that if you choose to talk to me, and I don't care what you've done. I've heard things that would make your head spin. 
All I care is about getting you better and then out of here. And how do we do that? He asked, but didn't wait for my reply and went on to tell me anyway. We start by talking through your issues, but if you clamp up, which most kids do, you might be in here for a long, long time, so it's up to you. Now, should we start again? Gildmore smiled. Your file says your parents divorced and you and your mother moved to Connecticut just last year. He scanned the page and then looked up. Riverview, huh? The river, covered bridge, lovely homes, nestled in the woods. It seems like an ideal place to live. Why don't you tell me about it? Yeah, it seems like a nice place. Then your grades began to drop. Gildmore leaned forward to read the file closely. You started getting in trouble. You had fights at school. So what happened? You didn't like your teachers? Pissed off at your parents? What? I rode the tard cart. The tard cart? One year One earlier, year earlier, earlier, earlier. Horse face turned, eyeballing me as I walked down the aisle of the mini school bus at 6.45 on the first day of school. Well, what's your name? Kelly. You called me the seal, snorted the bus driver in a voice that matched her looks. Yeah. A kid named Roger said in a deep and guttural voice staring wildly through strap-on magnifying lens glasses. I smiled at the girl in the back of the van who rolled her eyes and turned up her headphones. Lucille grabbed the lever, slammed the door, and drove down the steep and narrow road that a regular school bus couldn't handle. She honked when we got to the next stop. The screen door bashed open and the kid ran out, leaping over the potted plants on the front porch like he was storming a military obstacle course, and then dove into the seat across from me. Toby's wavy hair looked plastered to his skull with fistfuls of gel, and a half dozen razor scrapes boasted that the 14-year-old already needed to shave. On the way to school, Toby started to flip out with flashbacks from playing video games, so Horseface howled into a rearview mirror for him to calm down. After a 10-minute ride, our little van pulled in front of the school, grinding to a stop alongside the 10 regular school buses. When she opened the door, Toby scrambled forward, leaping off the minivan first, and then charging toward the side entrance, where a special ed teacher was waiting. I made a real fine target for the preps, who were getting out of their buses as we all walked into the school together. They talked junk and tried to get in my way. Help! I'm too retarded to ride the bus, they joked. Hey, aren't you supposed to go through the side door with the rest of the tongue shoes? They circled me like a gang of vampire preps. So I picked up the pace. Hey Gator, look, a lost retard. They broke into hysterical fits of laughter. Check out those Velcro sneakers. Corky doesn't know how to tie his shoes. I don't care what I wear. Yeah, and it shows, Gator responded. And after the next round of laughter, a blinding red slap stung the side of my face. Oh, oh. Get Get the yelling got louder as we turned in circles, facing each other with doubled fists. The preps began to chant, low at first, and then working themselves into a frenzy, and I knew I'd gotten stuck. There was no way out of this now. They inched forward, getting more excited by the second, all dying to see a fight, and thrilled that it wasn't them in the center ring, because that would have scared the hell out of any of them. The racket brought dozens more, just as bloodthirsty, running in from all sides and bunching in around us. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Gator sneaking around the edge of the pit until he was out of sight. Then I was violently shoved forward toward Sean. We grabbed each other, only letting go of our grasp to land a few punches. I could taste salty blood as I stumbled to the side but was caught by the inner ring of students and shoved back into him. I saw flashes of their faces, ugly and howling. Gator continued to weave in and out of the pack using the others as camouflage as he pushed us into each other so would have no option other than to brawl. Sean gritted his pointy teeth and rammed his fist into my face. I tried to back away, only to be shoved into a left hook. We tangled up, Sean fighting dirty, and reached out to gouge my eyes or rip at my face with his dirty, ragged fingernails. The inner ring grew tighter as more students ran and jumped on each other's backs to get a glimpse of the action compressing us into a tighter and tighter circle. We locked up, shoved each other's faces back, and took tight swings. Then someone was yelling, Teacher! Teacher! 
and like a well-planned drill, the students turned and calmly walked away. I looked into the distance and saw a pudgy man, squinting and waddling toward us. We were almost down to the innermost ring, the original kids who started the fight, when Sean saw his chance to snuff me real good with a sucker punch to the nose, bleeding it, then he took off with his cronies. I tried to get out of there too, holding my nose and trying to stop the blood from leaking all over my sweatshirt when the teacher called out, Hey you, you in the blue, freeze. Wait, wait right there, buddy boy. I stopped walking, knowing he meant me, and waited for the pudgy guy to chug over. I leaned forward, breathing hard, and spitting and dripping blood from my nose and lip. As he got closer, he checked out my scraped and bloodied face disgustedly and roared, Follow me! He shuffled toward the school building, breathing as heavily as me. Come on, hurry up! I haven't got all day. Lots of other kids have come here for a proper education, and here you are going around disturbing everyone. The teacher spun around and reached for the door, glaring at me as he held it open. But I didn't do anything wrong. Tell it to the principal, not me. What about the others? What others? I didn't see anyone else. At least no one else covered in blood. What do you think, I was fighting myself? Don't play smart with me. You're new this year, aren't you? Yeah? Where from? New York? City? He asked with widened eyes. Yeah, doesn't surprise me. Once in the main office, the principal opened his door and motioned me in. Do you want to go to the nurse? It's just a nosebleed, I said into my shirt. What? He raised his voice. I lowered my shirt and spoke slowly. No thanks, it's just a nosebleed. Well, you're going anyway. For a moment, he looked almost impressed. Must have been a doozy of a fight. Not really. Tough guy, eh? No, I answered and he frowned. Who are you fighting? I don't know his name. This is my first day of school here. Ah, new to Riverview and already in a fight. Not off to a good start. Now are you? No, I agreed, thinking he might be cool after all, but then he glared, like I just reminded him that he should have been pissed off. I hope you're not going to be a problem for this, for this school because of some adjusting issues you may have. No, I won't be a problem. It's no big deal. No big deal, he repeated as if he couldn't believe what I'd said. Well, yes it is. Fighting is a big deal and his grounds for being expelled. That's not what I meant. I hope you can stay with us because if this starts to be a behavior problem for you, I'll have no problem kicking you out of my school. I won't make any more problems for you. That's what I want to hear, he smiled. I have faith that you can make it through your first year without any more issues. But that's going to be entirely up to you. In other words, the ball is in your court. Then I'm going to slam dunk it. Excuse me? The principal glared, nervously shuffling papers. Nothing. I mean, I won't be a problem. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. I hope we understand one another. Yes, I said, and thanks. You know, I find you slightly odd, but even so, I'm still going to take it easy on you. But only this one time. So here are your options. Either one week detention or a three day home suspension. The choice is yours. The next day I told mom I was staying after school with some friends I didn't have to do a history project that didn't exist. At lunch, this kid named Andrew sat hunched over, polishing his glasses while Toby grinned into his bag of Doritos, shoving handful after handful of orange goop into his face and chewing with his mouth open. Then Roger smashed his fist into the middle of his sandwich. Dead meat, he growled in his burnt voice. This was called the loser table. So I took a deep breath and walked away with my tray past him. Andrew cocked his head interestedly and watched me head for a table that appeared more neutral in the ninth grade infrastructure. These particular kids looked baffled but didn't object when I grabbed one of the empty seats. Then more kids rolled up and stood behind me, nervously fidgeting and holding their trays. I ignored them and tried to eat a slab of bleached rubber chicken. Hey, you're in my seat. I sit there every day, one kid said, almost politely, so I slid over. Nice try, but now you're in my place, echoed another. I looked over at two teachers standing about five feet away as they manned the outer perimeter of the mess hall. They took no notice of the room, but chatted to each other instead. If I get up, then where will I sit, I asked. How about over there, one snapped back, pointing. Yeah, man, you just can't sit wherever you want. The kids who were safely planted began to turn on me, so I was forced into following a local delegate who ushered me back to the table that apparently always had plenty of open chairs.